One thing, if you're a regular listener to my show, you've probably heard at some point me talking about tournaments and how much I'm a huge fan of tournaments, whether I'm running them, just watching them, or competing in them. It's always something I really look forward to. And that's one thing that really gravitated me towards Bellator was the fact that they, they had these tournaments, which were ma- and resulted in merit-based title shots. You win the tournament, you get an opportunity to fight for the title. Fantastic. I was kind of disappointed when they ruled them out, but obviously they've opted to... Like, we had the Strike Force Grand, Grand Prix back in the day, and now Scott Coker is creating this Bellator Heavyweight Grand Prix to crown a new champion, which I was very excited about. It's, very, it's exciting. And I'm very much looking forward to it. this very unique tournament, considering they've got four heavyweights and four light heavyweights competing for the title. I was I was a little bit surprised how they brought, put the brackets together. Honestly, I thought Chael Sonnen was being drawn in to face Fedor and give Fedor a, a win, some hype, and an opportunity to move into the second round. But they opted to, opted to go in a different direction. And you know, Frank Mir is a pretty tough fight for Fedor, Fedor Emelianenko. Not impossible, obviously, but I'm very much looking forward to it. The fact that Rory McDonald has thrown his hat into the ring, I think it's kind of cool. I, I almost wonder if it's not some type of publicity stunt. Just say, look how tough this guy is with the brackets already set and everything already set up. Then he says, but Shane Carwin, very interesting, has said, I'd like to be an alternate. I, I, I'd like to see Shane Carwin get back in. The heavyweight division always needs new faces or at least new old faces. So, again, I'm very excited to see how that tournament plays out. I think it's very cool. I'd love to see the UFC get into the tournament business a little bit. And it could add some significance to some of their lower card fights if they have opportunities for guys to compete to win some extra cash and be crowned a, a season tournament champion. Um... Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. Always, I am your host, Scott Johnson. On this episode of the show, we are breaking down the upcoming UFC Fight Night 122 event, which will take place in Shanghai, China. The first time the UFC has traveled to mainland China, which should be exciting. And again, keep in mind, because we are overseas, at least where I am, uh, we are looking at a fight, an event that takes place at 7 a.m. Eastern Time, 4 a.m. Pacific Time. That's the main card. The prelims will start much earlier than that, I'm guessing that I'm not going to be up in time to watch the prelims because they do get kick things off so early. And, you know, there's some pretty decent f- fights on this card. We have, though, unfortunately, you know, some of the lower main card fights, or prelim fights, aren't exactly high-profile bouts. So I'm sure the viewership at this on this side of the world might be down a little bit, but still I'm looking forward to catching them on Fight Pass after the fact. Uh, we have four main card predictions. I'll be raking all of them down. I'm coming off a, not, a pretty decent showing. I went 9-4 and four overall. I lost two split decisions. They were crucial split decisions. I had an, an, a, a serviceable night as far as winning money with my bet packs, but not. it would have been fantastic. It would have been huge had uh, Boyan Velikovic got the victory. And I think he did get the victory for Jake Matthews, but he got screwed in a split decision. And then the other fight was Tim Means losing to uh, Bilal Muhammad. I thought that was a little bit less of a screw job, but either way, I thought Tim Means still, still also could have been given the win in that fight as well. And, of course, you look at that record, that's suddenly I'm 11-2 and two and we're raking in the dough. And, hey, it, it is what it is. We'll uh, rebound and come back stronger. I'm still in search of 300 victories in a calendar year as far as the UFC is concerned. And I'm just quickly taking a peek at my record and how I currently stand. And the internet decides to be exactly slow when I need to be. I have a 244 victories in 2017 and 150 losses. My best, my most victories was in 2014. I had 299 wins, which is that's pretty solid. That's pretty a pretty decent run. But like currently, I'm sitting. What am I sitting? 56 victories short of the 300 victory mark. And if you look at the calendar, as far as what the UFC has to offer for the rest of the year, we have what one event left in November. This is the final event in November, and then we have five events. That's six events. I need 56 victories, so I need to average ooh, eight nine. Nine wins, just over nine victories a show to get there. So again, I those two split decisions really hurt. I need to have a couple good shows to give me a little bit of wiggle room. But uh, hey, it's not out of the realm of possibility just yet. And hey, on that note, the need to win fights and correctly predict them, let's get to our first main card prediction. The first of four main card fights takes place in the UFC's welterweight division as Alex the Dominican Nightmare Garcia, 14 wins and four losses, takes on the debuting Muslim, the king of Kung Fu, Sal- Salikov. Uh, fighting out of Russia with a current record of 12 wins and one defeat. Now, taking a look at here, after starting 2 0, Garcia has alternated wins and losses. He got off to a pretty good start in the UFC, but he's alternated wins and losses over his last five appearances. And those wins in that span coming over older guys like Mike Pyle and uh, Mike, uh, Mike Swick, so guys that you know are at the end, end of their career or are, are pushing close to the, to the limits, where he's fought, lost to fighters who are certainly more in their prime. Now, looking at Selikov, Salikov, I'm probably saying that incorrectly, but Sal- either way, uh, he's won back-to-back fights where UFC veterans uh, Ivan Yor- George and Melvin Gillard, notably, both by first-round KO. He will be two inches taller than Garcia, but he's also three years older. So coming in, the Russian, not exactly a young uh, pup coming into this matchup. So he is uh, 
making his move to the UFC a little bit later in his career. Now, he comes from a Sanshu background. He has 10 wins by knockout, a single submission victory, and a single decision victory on his record. All his fights that he's ended via stoppage have come in the first round with the exception of one decision win obviously that went three rounds which happened earlier in his career for Garcia he is two and three in his last five fights to go go to round three conversely has 10 victories by first round stoppage now Salikov he turns you know you look at some of his last performances very impressive that's Sanchu background offers a very strong kicking base he dropped uh Ivan George with a brutal spinning back uh a turning side kick to the chin, brutal KO. He took out Melvin Glover with a wheel kick that knocked him out. He has a couple other uh, kick-based uh, knockouts on his record, so obviously that's something he wants to throw. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, it's worth noting that both the guys he just knocked out have each been knocked out four times in their career, three times prior to the, the stoppage against Selikov. So they're not guys that have ironclad chins that are that are known to uh, be difficult to put away. So that's that's certainly worth noting there. He tends to throw a lot of single strikes. Decent power, obviously, behind him with the numbers suggesting that. But uh, the big question is, what happens if his opponents avoid those big bombs or they don't fold up when they land? Is this an issue that he's going to have as the fight drags on and that style of throwing those flashy techniques and flashy maneuvers that are looking for one-off knockouts, it it doesn't hold up over 15 minutes. Now, Garcia has been stopped twice, but both those stoppages came beyond beyond the first round. And you look at the Sean Strickland one, the most recent one in particular, he put a lot of damage. That came in the third round. He put a lot of damage on Garcia before he was eventually able to finish him. And you look at the guys that have beat Garcia recently, and they've put up some pretty good striking numbers. Tim Means landed 64 significant strikes. The aforementioned Strickland, 84 significant strikes. They landed a lot of shots to put him down. Neil Magny needed 39 significant strikes over three rounds. But he also worked in three takedowns. So it's, it's a offensive attack built around volume. That has been the key to defeating Garcia. So again, you go back to that question. What happens if Selikov is forced to fight beyond the opening round? Does he have the gas tank? To do so, we really don't know. He is one on one in fights ended by submission, and that, the second question is, how will he fare if he's put on his back by Garcia? Garcia is a fairly strong wrestler, and he really you know does well when he can put guys on his back. And if you combine those two, the takedowns and the prolonged fight, those are two areas of concern that the Russian fighter absolutely has to be uh, focused on defending here. And you look at Garcia; he landed five takedowns in his win over Swick, eight in his victory over Sean Spencer, and he landed three in each of his losses to Neil Magny and Sean Strickland. So he knows how to put up volume as far as takedowns are concerned. And for a fighter who's not used to getting off his back and used to having quick fights just the, the, the act of getting taken down defending getting back to a vertical base it's a lot that's it's certainly it's one of those things that uh it can take a lot out of them now we have seen garcia as far as his cardio is concerned he's had issues holding up over longer fights he's not exactly a cardio horse like a diaz brother or something like that but you know again he at least has gone deeper in fights and held up not too bad you know but the big thing is with him, in order to wear him out, fighters have to push him. They can't allow him to dictate the pace with his wrestling. They have to push him, make him work hard, and that's when he starts to slow down. Is that Salikov's type of fight? Not really. Garcia's a powerhouse. He's physically strong. He's a decent pop on his feet. Bigger factor, though, is his ground and pound. Once he gets on top and can establish control, he can really do some damage with that ground and pound. He gets a lot of his takedowns from the clinch where he gets in close, establishes control, and slams his opponent to the mat. And again, that's the type of thing where if he gets in close, gets inside the kicking range, it takes away Salikov, one of his uh, biggest weapons. Now, the Russian, he's going to look for that early finish, but I think Garcia's going to come out looking to close the distance, clinch, wrestle. He's you know he's a tri-star trained fighter. I think he's going to have a game plan set up with Faraz Sahabi around negating the biggest strength of his fighter and taking advantage of those question marks that he has. You know, it's hard to trust a fighter with next to no experience beyond the opening round who's making his debut against probably a bigger step up in competition than he's used to. Garcia, I think he's going to avoid those early shots. He's going to close that gap. He's going to take him down. He'll wear him out of rounds one and two, and that potentially will lead to a finish. So my prediction is Alex Garcia to defeat Muslim Salikov by TKO. Fight number two in the main card takes place in the UFC's featherweight division as Alex Bruce Leroy Caceres, always a fan favorite, coming with a record of 13 wins, 10 losses, and a single no contest, takes on China's own Wang the Dongbei Tiger Guan, again, probably butchering that name, with a very impressive record of 16 wins, one loss, and one draw. Now, Caceres is a well-traveled UFC fighter. Since coming to the UFC, he's fought all over. He's fought in Singapore, he's fought in Japan twice, he's fought in China, and he's fought in Toronto as well. Not so, not such a big, you know, foreign place. But fighting in the States, anytime you leave the, the borders and head somewhere else, at least it's a challenge. And it's interesting to note, in those fights, he is 4-1. He would be 4-1. He had his win over Kung Ho Kang, overturned, Kung Ho Kong, sorry, overturned uh, for testing positive for marijuana. So he's 4-1 you know, theoretically, 3-1 and one in reality. But still, that's an impressive record for a guy who's traveling on the road and usually fighting locals or people more acclimatized to fighting there. Now, for Guan, he's won four fights in a row, including a decision victory for Shane Young, who he just saw compete last weekend against uh, Alex uh, Alexander Volkanovsky. Uh, he has, Guan has been out of action for 11 months. He fought twice in 2014 and just once each in 2015 and 2016. So the activity rate 
not exactly great for the UFC newcomer. Guan is an inch taller, but Caceres is the younger man by two years. I'm not sure of uh, Guan's reach. Now, looking at Guang first, he has um, 10 wins by knockout, which is, that's, 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 that's damn impressive. 10 wins by knockout, two submission victories, four decision victories. His only loss coming by decision. But it's worth noting his last opponent came with a record of 0-2. But then again, his other more recent uh, conquers have been over guys with respectable records. Uh, inside the cage, he stalks his opponent very well. He cuts off the cage. He throws a hard overhand right. He'll mix in a left jab and a right uppercut. He will go to the body with some decent kicks. Now, he is a pressure counter striker. He moves forward, and we've seen some other guys do this as well. With you know Conor McGregor kind of fits into this role. He moves forward. He forces opponents to kind of almost panic because the pressure he's putting on them. They throw the first strike, and then you slide out of the ray, and you fire back a counter. So you, you know, anticipate what they're going to do, and you counter. And that can be very effective. But at the same time, and with Guan, it allows his opponents to dictate the pace. He's not a high-volume striker. He doesn't have the fastest of hands. So in that situation... That style, you need to be very careful with it, especially as you move up and you know as your in your level of competition increases, because you're allowing your opponents to hit you first potentially. You're allowing them to get off first routinely, which weighs with the judges. And if your hands aren't that quick, they might be able to attack and then slip out of the way, and they might even counter your attempt to counter, which is worth noting as well. With Caceres, who's a pretty rangy striker in his own right, um, he threw an awkward flying knee in his last fight, which kind of threw me off a little bit. I didn't really like the way he executed that, and he got put on his back and spent a lot of time there. He ultimately was saved by a ref stand up. You know, he showed decent hips on initial take and attempt in the second round. Uh, sorry, later in that first round, actually. But his opponent kept pushing and eventually put him down. They just kept driving and turning the corner and put him down. And he didn't get back up until the, the round ended. Uh, he, you know, his only career loss actually came on the strength of a takedown heavy uh, victory by a guy who currently is challenging for the or former World Series of Fighting. He challenged for, for the former World Series of Fighting title. So it's worth noting that, you know, he can be put down on the ground and can you know, lose fights and lose points as a result. Now, Bruce Leroy, he's a very long fighter. Not a lot of power, not a lot of power, but it's more than people expect. And it's almost like at 145, he's not draining himself as much, and it allows him to pack a little bit more behind his punches. I like the way his striking flows. He's his, He varies his offense very effectively. He keeps opponents guessing. He has that consistent pace and output and good cardio throughout a fight, which I really like. You know, when he fought against... Uh, Orlando die. He threw some nice angles and variety at him. He dug the body exceptionally well, and he kept him backed up along the cage, which really limited his space and eventually allowed him to get that uh, TKO stoppage. He has struggled in times in the past with aggressive fighters with power, which is worth noting because that's not what he's faced with here. You know, they 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 move forward and they engage and they attack and they back him off and they hurt him, and that seems to make him a little bit gun shy. And that's not what he's facing. He's facing a guy who's aggressive and he's got power, but they don't mix. They, they counter. They, they're, they're they're a counter striker, which is going to allow Caceres to be the first to the exchange in most scenarios. Now, Bruce Lee is not a huge wrestling threat, but he's an excellent scrambler and capable submission fighter. He, in fact, will tire guys out just by how active he is on the mat. And that's something, if he can find a way to get this fight to the ground, maybe score a takedown, because Juan doesn't exactly have a strong takedown uh, offensive game, so it probably would rely on Caceres to get this fight to the mat. He certainly could find an advantage there. Now, Caceres, again, he's had some issues being submitted, but again, not so much an issue here against a non-ground threat in uh, Guan Wang. Now, if Guan allows Caceres, Wang Guan, sorry, if Guan allows Caceres to dictate the pace, he's going to fall behind quickly. I, I think that's the thing. He's doing with a quick, uh, with a faster, more varied fighter, and it's going to be hard for him to catch up, especially if he can't land those single big strike out strikes that usually put his opponents down. Caceres has to be ready for the counter strikes. There's no denying that. He can't get too reckless and get too ridiculous, but again, he looked very good against Dai when he had him backed up, throwing multi-punch combinations, again, like his digging into the body, doing a lot of things that kept Dai guessing, and Orlando Dai is a decent striker, but he really had nothing for Caceres in that matchup. If they hit the mat... Alex should have a massive advantage, and a submission is certainly a possibility. But my prediction is Bruce Leroy, Alex Caceres, to defeat Wang Guan by decision. In the co-main event of the evening, it's a very interesting matchup in the welterweight division as Li Jingliang, the leech, if you will, of China, arguably are easily China's biggest UFC fighter on the roster, 13 wins and 4 losses, takes on Zach the, Barbar the Barbarian Otto with a current record of 15 wins and 4 defeats. Now, Jingliang has won 3 consecutive fights and has gained a nice following. He's a very scrappy fighter, and I really like watching him fight. Two of those wins coming by knockout, and he's 4-2 and two overall in the UFC. For Otto, he's 2-1 in the promotion, all three fights, though, ending via split decision. That's pretty interesting. The fact he's won two of them is even even better. One of them short notice to Sean, uh, Josh Berkman. And, you know, that's interesting. Now, for Lee, he's, he's one inch taller. Otto will have a one-inch reach advantage. And Lee is the younger fighter by two years. 
Now, looking first at the American, Otto striking look, looked much sharper against Kunamoto in his last matchup. He throws a nice left jab, he'll fire a hard overhand right, and he will punch the body. He looked fairly sharp. He maintains a consistent output, he switches stances to give him different looks and throw different things at his opponents, and he doesn't do anything overly flashy, but again, simple sometimes can be better with some fighters. He averages 3.24 strikes landed per minute versus 2.38 strikes absorbed, so pretty much one strike more than his opponents are able to hit him. And he has landed more strikes in all three of his fights, including his uh, loss. Uh, he showed good takedown defense against Kunamoto, at least early on. He stayed in the middle of the cage to avoid getting pushed into the cage. He got his hips back whenever put, you know, shots came his way and defended in the clinch fairly effectively. Now, he was taken on a couple of times, but he effectively was able to sweep, get off his back. At least earlier in the fight, he spent a lot of time in the third round on his back, and that almost cost him a very close matchup. Now, for Jing Liang, he's an incredibly aggressive striker. He pushes forward, and because he pushes forward so aggressively, he can be hurt. Uh, we saw Frank Camacho hurt him early in that fight. We saw Bobby Nash, who's also fighting the undercard of this matchup, also hurt him. Lee re rallied and won both those matchups, but again, his aggression can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing as well. He throws a solid left jab. He keeps pumping it and firing it, you know, fires it out. After, you know, trying, again, it's disrupting his opponent's timing because they see that jab constantly in their face, at least, you know, part of the way. And then, boom, one of them actually comes the full distance and cracks him. He throws a lot of inside low kicks, and he's a volume striker. 4.68 strikes landed per minute. Again, as I said, he gets hit a lot. 3.26 strikes absorbed per minute. But, again, that's a pretty good ratio. You're averaging, what's that, better than 1.4 strikes better than your opponent. That, that, that'll add up over 15 minutes. His UFC best, 94 significant strikes coming in his last fight against Camacho. He throws pretty good combinations. He mixes in a hard uppercut as well. He throws that straight right right down the pot, down the chamber through the pocket, which is very again a good for a guy who's got some good pop and willingness to move forward. I like that straight. Throw it right down the middle. It can it beats anything your opponent throws over the top or around the outside. It's going to beat them to the punch almost every time. He will look to mix in takedowns. And again, his, his takedowns, he primarily looks for body locks and works a trip in. Really likes to grind his opponent out once he gets on top. Now, Otto doesn't offer a high output, or as high an output as uh, Lee does, but I give him the edge in technique, and I would say he has a better chin. Lee has been hurt on a couple occasions, as I mentioned, but Otto doesn't have a, he packs a wall up, but he's not a big knockout threat. You know, I think the problem with Otto in this fight, he's going to be fighting off his back foot. He's a good grappler but he's going to be forced to be very defensive for a lot of this fight because Lee pushes forward so much. He should be able to defend uh, the majority of the takedowns, but with Lee, it seems like all it takes is one opportunity to put the, his opponent on the ground, and he can go to work, and Otto can be stuck on his back. There are major concerns that Otto has had issues in split decisions. Yes, he's won two of his three in the UFC, but again, he's having trouble distancing, distancing himself in fights, and eventually that will catch up to you as you should take a step up in competition. I would say Lee is a nice step up from Kunamoto, where Kunamoto is a pretty good grappler with a serviceable striking. Lee is a is a good gra is a good wrestler with better, more effective, more dangerous striking. You know, and the other question is, this is a fight taking place in China, in a co-main event against a Chinese fighter. If Otto does not decisively come out and finish him or win a one-sided decision, it's going to be very difficult for him to win a close decision. Not impossible, but certainly that has to weigh in your mind. You know, Lee's success will be on the strength of his aggression, and, you know, if his chin holds up, he needs to work at a better pace, engage, maybe score a takedown or two, hold top position, but just be more active and impactful as an, a striker. Hard not to see the UFC setting up their biggest Chinese name in a winnable fight in the Chinese market. I think that's what the case is. And my prediction is Jing Le is uh, Li Jing Leong to defeat Zach Otto by TKO. We move now to the main event of the evening, and this is a bout that, unlike the majority of fights on this card, we have two noteworthy established fighters that are just it's 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 basically the be the be all and end all of this card, and. Uh, as the number nine ranked former Ultimate Fighter winner Calvin Gastelum, 14 wins, three losses, and one no contest, takes on the former middleweight champion, number two ranked fighter in the division, Michael the Count Bisbing, 31 wins, eight losses. Bisbing stepping in on short notice for the former, another former champion, Anderson Silva, of course, popped by USADA and forced to withdraw, possibly ending his career. I don't know. We'll see how that plays out. But either way, Bisbing showing he has coconuts on him like you wouldn't believe, stepping up after just three weeks, a three week turnaround after losing his middleweight title to George St. Pierre via submission. And he knows he's at the end of his career. He's coming down. He's talked about an uh, upcoming event in London where, he's, where, he, where he wants to compete and call it a career. So he's taking an opportunity to fight here against Calvin Gastelum. And, uh, you know, hats off to him. Win, lose, or draw. That's impressive. Now, for Gastelum, he's putting on a pretty good run as a middleweight fighter. He beat, obviously, Uriah Haldwin, the ultimate fighter. He beat Nate Marquardt at middleweight as well. 
Uh, more recently, he beat Tim Kennedy. He beat Vitor Belfort before that was turned into a no contest. And then he got submitted by former champion Chris Weidman in a middle in a bout that saw Gastelum basically dust Weidman, drop him, almost knock him out, and then spend the but spend the majority of the fight on his back before getting submitted. Now Bisbing is four inches taller. He will have a four inch reach advantage over Kelvin, but Kelvin is the younger man by a whopping twelve years. And the big question is again, it's Calvin. How long? He's not a big. He's not an overly big welterweight when he fights there, at least long welterweight like a Neil Magny. So the big question is, how long can he compete at middleweight for the size just becomes too much for him? We saw it become too much for him against Chris Weidman. Is Michael Bisping the type of fighter that's going to exploit that scenario and make it work in his favor? I don't know. We'll talk about that shortly. But the bigger question here, as far as Michael Bisping is concerned, is how does Bisping come back from a title fight defeat? You know he's coming back. Uh, he, you know, he was coming on in that fight against George St. Pierre before he got finished, before he got knocked down and got submitted. You know, now he's a former champion. He's an underdog, as he said. Fuck it, I don't have the belt anymore. I might as well fight. But is that men? Is that a good mentality to have? Is he being a little bit reckless? Is is it too much too soon? Is that going to affect him? How you know where where is he at right now? Stepping into this matchup um, for Kelvin Gastelum, obviously he's had the opponent change from Anderson Silva. That's a big change, but again, it's not. It's, he's had some time to prepare for this. Um, when you look at what Kelvin Gastelum's done, he absolutely wore out Tim Kennedy with strikes for a TKO. He knocked out Vitor Belfort on the feet, and he dropped Chris Weidman on the feet. He did the same as Nate Marquardt, just put so many strikes on that eventually the fight had to be stopped. But the issues he's had at welterweight have come with grappling. In the Kennedy matchup, the early action saw Tim Kennedy having success with his grappling, clinging to Kelvin Gastelum, making him work hard. Kelvin was on the defensive, defending, 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 eventually got the better of it, took him out. Chris Weidman, wrestling, dominated that fight with the exception of a couple exchanges, including the one he got knocked down in and eventually submitted him. So again, it seems like if Kelvin can keep the fight standing and work his striking, he's in great shape. If he's forced to defend grappling attacks, he's on the defensive. You know, that's not Bisbing's style, that second half. He uses volume and cardio to outwork and wear down his opponents on route to either decision win or at some point a stoppage. He's got enough power to sell with Luke Rockwell to put somebody down in the opening round. There's no denying that, but predominantly when you think of Michael Bisbing, you think of volume, cardio, and death by accumulation. Can he do that to Kelvin Gastelum? Kelvin has had some cardio issues in the past, but that usually has t- been tied, especially in the Tyrone Woodley fight, has been tied to his struggles making 170 pounds. And that's worth noting as well. It's something that's, you know, if he, if Kelvin's not going to have cardio, a cardio problem, he's, if he's going to be able to match Bisbing, that takes away might one, counts one of his biggest weapons. Can Kelvin find success with his wrestling? Does he need to? He's landed almost no takedowns at middleweight. Again, he's recognized that some of his physical disparities with his opponents are going to prevent him from dominating. George St. Pierre, an excellent wrestler took Bisbing down, but unable to hold him down. So I really struggle to see if Kelvin Gastelum is going to be able to hold him down or take him off his feet because Bisbing's got excellent counter-wrestling. Kelvin's aggressive. He's got good cardio. He hits very hard. He strings combinations together very well. His striking is getting better with every single fight. And he's finding ways to get on the inside and hit big monster men like Chris Wyman and drop him. He didn't do it enough, but again, that's a learning experience. I give him a speed advantage over Bisbing, and I'd say his cardio is good enough to hold up against the count over five rounds if it goes that far. Bisbing's chin's still a major issue. GSP found the mark and dropped him. Bisbing, I think it's too quick a turnaround for the count. I love him, the fact that he's getting in there, but I think it's too much too soon. For Bisbing, the victory scenario here is superior cardio and volume. It's not there. This is not the type of fight he traditionally wins. He's not going to out cardio Calvin Gaslam. He's going to struggle to out volume him. I don't know if he has the durability to hold up against Calvin. He has some big shots if he's able to land them, even though we've seen Bisbing survive shots from Dan Henderson recently. And obviously not going out against George. He's still he was put down. Gaslam's defeat scenario, again, physically imposing opponents with wrestling heavy attacks to ground him and either submit him or earn a decision. That's not Michael Bisbing's forte. It doesn't happen. Again, it's too much too soon for Bisbing. He hasn't a full camp. It's a post-title fight letdown scenario, and my prediction is Kelvin Gastelum to defeat Michael Bisbing by TKO. So those are my four main card predictions for UFC Fight Night 122. Again, it's taking place early in the morning, so if you're one of the Fight Pass subscribers, you might wake up and catch it later. But again, get your bets in as early as possible. Again, I'm going to do my best to get the prelim predictions done, get everything posted a little bit earlier so you have some time. Uh, before the event kicks in to make your bets. Again, don't shy away from betting on these cards because you don't know the fighters. You know, 
I'm not guaranteeing I'm going to get them right, but I'll put the research in to figure out who's going to win some of these lesser-known fighters, some of these debuting guys we don't know about, and see if we can find scenarios where the odds makers don't know any better than we do, or at least they miss something. See if we can find an edge somewhere. So certainly worth taking a look at, whether it's me or someone else you're paying attention to. Do not shy away from betting on these cards simply because you don't know fighters, but listen to the people who are putting that time and effort in, or do it yourself, because there are certainly opportunities to take advantage of things here. As always, thank you for tuning in. I th- did I mention all my prelim predictions available at KamikazeOverdrive.net? If I didn't, I just did. Thank you for tuning in. You can follow me at uh, Twitter or KO underscore predictions on Twitter. Uh, you can search me up on Facebook. Uh, closing in on 1,800 subscribers on YouTube, which isn't bad. It's not great. Whatever it is, what it is. Um, and uh, on that note, I think it's time to shut her down and uh, get to the business at hand. So, again, thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Hi.